Hello. Hello, today I wanted to show you the solutions for exercise of the fourth lecture, that is basically solar thermal systems. First question was, which are the loss mechanisms at solar thermal energy systems? So if you take into consideration a typical flat blade collector and you follow the sun inside the modules. So in the first interface you have optical losses as it's reflection on the glass surfaces. If you pass through the glass, you have absorption losses inside the glass, depending on the quality of the glass. Then you have reflection of irradiance leaving the cover glass. So we have several cover glasses at in the vicinity of another 4% at each interface. Then you have also non-perfect absorbers. So you have some reflection at the absorbers. If you come now to the thermal losses, so you have heat conduction. So the absorber absorbs a large part of the irradiance, but the heat is not entirely transferred to your media, for example, water. You have some conduction, for example, from the absorber to the frame or to the ground or to the roof. You have also thermal convection. So the surrounding air is getting heated up. And while hot air is warmer than cold air, it goes up and you have convection, so-called natural convection, and the warm air is then substituted by cold air, and by this you have some heat losses. Also, you have thermal radiation. You have a radiation exchange between the warm surfaces with the ground and the sky. Here are some typical quantity at a typical flat blade collector. So you have a reflection at each interface in the vicinity about 4% of a glass blade. So 4% in the top, 4% by leaving the glass altogether. If you see here, two interfaces, 8% of losses here. Absorption also depending on the quality of the glass and the thickness of the glass are typically 2%. Then you have reflection at the absorber, in the vicinity also of 8% typically. Then you have thermal losses, as I mentioned, the natural convection is about 13% and is more when there would be wind and no cover glass. You have thermal radiation from the absorber plate, it's about 6%. If you increase the temperature, this thermal radiation exchange is drastically increased because the temperature goes in the formula with a power of 4. And you have here thermal conduction, which is linear to the temperature increase. Altogether, typically you get about 60% of the incoming power from the sun. Second question, what is the advantage of solar thermal electrical power systems in terms of possible storage compared to direct electricity conversion via photovoltaics? Yes, advantage, as I mentioned already in the lecture, solar thermal energy can be easily stored in a thermal storage, for example, by water tank or using a phase change material. Costs add up then for large scale systems, they are in the vicinity of about five cents per kilowatt hour. Electrical storage is much more difficult and more expensive. If you buy a battery, you have about 15 cents per kilowatt hour of cost for small scale storage. If you use a pumped hydropower plant, it goes down to the vicinity of five cents per kilowatt hour of stored energy or cycled energy. Let's come to number three. What are the two main technical disadvantages of concentrating solar power systems? What could be an advantage? The disadvantage is that only the direct part of solar irradiance can be used. This is, depends on weather and site dependent. Usually in Germany, the share of diffuse irradiance is quite high. So you only can profit from a small part of it. And you additionally have to track the reflector to the direct sunlight, that means to the sun. And you have also to clean those reflectors permanently. And this makes the whole construction quite expensive. Advantage is you can achieve higher temperatures and higher temperatures allow a higher Carnot efficiency of a Carnot engine. So this is the maximum achievable efficiency, one minus T ambient divided by the collector temperature, not in great degree Celsius, but in Kelvin. 
fourth. For the collectors from the page 173, where we show some different collectors, and now we simulate a buyer, he has two options. So one with a selective absorber, which costs 120 euro per square meter, and the other one which is cheaper, which only costs about 100 euro per square meter. So the question is, does that selective absorber make sense financially? for a required temperature difference of 50 degrees or 50 Kelvin or for 75 Kelvin. Let's do the mess. So first take a look at the graph here. So we have uh, here the middle blue line is a one glass absorber with a selective absorber and the darker one, darker blue is with a non-selective absorber. You see these two lines here. And as you see, with the selective absorber, you can achieve higher temperature and average the effective conversion efficiency is also higher. So let's take a look first at 50 degrees. Here from 50 degrees, first take a look at the non-absorbing collector. We have here an efficiency in the vicinity of 40%. If you take a look at the selective absorber, we have a higher efficiency which is here within your 52, 54%. This difference even is increased if you go to higher temperatures or higher temperature differences, for example, to 75 degrees or 75 Kelvin. You have here only efficiency of 10% or 12% for the non-selective absorber. If you go to the selective absorber, we have here still an efficiency also in the vicinity of 30%, so about four times better than the non-selective absorber, depending on the temperature difference required. So this is our graph readings here. So at 50 degrees temperature difference, we had here the conversion efficiency here by ETA for a non-selective absorber has been 40%. And for a selective absorber, 54%. If we go to the higher temperature difference, 75 degrees, then we only have conversion efficiency for the non-selective absorber of 11.5% and for the selective absorber of almost 40% of 39%. The cost of the generated energy is proportional to the purchase price of the collector and reservably is proportional to the conversion efficiency. So here C is for cost, eta is for conversion efficiency, so the relative cost is C divided by eta, and we have here the conversion fee is 0.4. We have a cost of 100 euro per square meters. This is a C divided by 0.4 conversion efficiency, that means this is uh, relatively 250 euro per square meter. Conversion efficiency of the selective absorber here in green, 54% more costly, so 120 euro per square meter divided by 0 0.54. This is 222 euro per square meter. So this is already a cost advantage. If you go to 75 Kelvin of temperature difference, you see here at a conversion efficiency of 11.5% only, for the non-selective absorber, you have costs of 870 euro per square meter. For the selective absorber, the costs 120 euro per square meter divided by 0 0.39 is 307 euro per square meter only. So this is, means you have a significant cost advantage the higher the temperature gets. So next question is 4.5. What would be the generation costs in cent per kilowatt hour for thermal energy over lifetime for 20 years for operation in Seville, Spain? Remember, global irradiance has been 1,944 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. We use a thermosiphon that has an effective area of the collector of two square meter and it would cost 1,000 euro, including mounting. So including BOS costs. In Paderborn, you need a pumped system with four square meter of collector, single class, and that would cost about 5,000 euros. In both cases, the temperature difference between collector and ambient would be 45 Kelvin. 
the storage tank of the tank has to be considered to accumulate and distribute all collected irradiance. What has to be considered besides the accumulated irradiance for an operation in Paderborn at a global irradiance of 950 kilowatt hours per square meter per year? To select the adequate characteristic, please choose a graph from the page 73 that is closest to the average irradiance over the whole year during daytime, 12 hours, and read the according conversion efficiency. So the efficiency is reduced for low irradiance levels. Sometimes the irradiance values won't be enough to a certain temperature required. So to consider the average irradiance value during daytime, so it's a rather rough estimation. So we have at Seville almost 2000 kilowatt hour per square meter per year divided by 365 days times 12 hours. So in average, we have here 443.8 watt per square meter. So the closest line here is the 400 watt per square meter line. You can read 37% of conversion efficiency for the 45 Kelvin. For Paderborn, we have 950 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And in average, it would be only 216.9 watt per square meter. So we choose a 200 watt per square meter. And if you require a 40 Kelvin in temperature difference, the efficiency goes down to zero. So we can disregard it as a valid solution. The other possibility, if we don't use a flat plate collector with zinc glass, we would use a vacuum collector, which is still able to produce a temperature difference of 40 Kelvin without having a conversion efficiency of zero. At this low irradiance level, I have to say. So this is our graph here. So here for temperature difference of 45 degrees here, we have here a conversion efficiency of 37%. If you see here already efficiency is at zero, already at 42. Temperature difference 45, it's for sure zero in Paderborn if you have the average. Heat generation over 20 years. So we have the efficiency, the medium efficiency, let's say, and you accumulate it for 20 years. So the heat production over 20 years is 28.77 megawatt hours. The specific cost of heat. So if the cost is 1000 euro and divided by the generated energy, 22.77 megawatt hours, you come to 3.48 cents per kilowatt hour. So if you go to Spain nowadays, you almost have this cost for photovoltaic electricity. So you have to also consider whether it still makes sense to use a solar thermal collector because you have also to consider the costly installation of hot water pipes rather than electrical cables. So another question 4.6, how long does it take for a solar thermal collector with an area of 2.3 square meters? For example, we saw the Turkish system there to heat up the water inside an attached storage tank with a volume of 160 liters of water at the initial temperature of 20 degrees, tap water in Southern hemisphere or southerly and output temperature of 60 degrees. The temperature of the top water should be considered as equal to ambient temperature and the temperature inside the collector should be considered as equal to the temperature inside the storage tank. First is, we do that for a constant irradiance of 800 watt per square meter. Second is for 400 watt per square meter. Third is for a constant irradiance of 200 watt per square meter. We have to consider the irradiance efficiency graph of page 172. A specific heat capacity of the water of CP is equal to 4.18 joule per gram Kelvin. Water density is one kilogram per liter or 1 million grams per cubic meter. So our required heat is delta T. This is our temperature difference between 20 and 60 degrees. The heat capacity of the water and the volume and the density. The available energy from solar is the irradiance times the area times the conversion efficiency and times, so this would be the power, if you multiply by the duration, delta t, not large t, but small t for time, 
and those should be equal. So the required energy should be equal to the delivered energy by the sun and the collector, including the efficiencies. So we have then a delta T, small t, is equal to the delta large T temperature difference times the heat capacity times the volume times the density of the water divided by the irradiance value times the area times the conversion efficiency. So we take the efficiency from the graph at page 172 and we have then an efficiency of 62% for the high irradiance level. Remember, efficiency has been quite good for high irradiance level. And if you put in the numbers of this 160 liters times the temperature difference times the heat capacity of the water, and then you come to a final value of 23,078 seconds, or that's equal to 6.41 hours. If you do it for 400 watt per square meter, efficiency is reduced. So it's not only proportional to the radiance, you have to consider also the reduced efficiency. And it takes almost three times as much time to heat up that volume. If you go to very low irradiance level, the efficiency is very poor. It's 4% only, and it takes 400.86 hours. So it's almost 14 days. 4.7. How can you eventually get different water temperatures from a single storage tanks? What prerequisites are necessary? What else can you do if you need lower water temperature than the usual water temperature in the storage tank? For example, if you need water for cooling. You can use the stratification inside the tank. As remember, when you discussed about the thermosiphon principles, you see at the top there is a hottest part. And if there's very little water movement, in the tank, you can extract the hot water from the top part of the water tank to find the cold water in the lower part. Prerequisite, you have a tank with a large vertical extension and little water movement. Cooling bank can be achieved by operating the solar system at nighttime. So you pump water or let it go automatically when you have a thermosiphon principle. So the cooling by the thermal radiation exchange with the sky can be achieved or by water evaporation. That's it. Thank you very much.